Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast. Today I am again joined by Right Ruminations. We're talking tonight about the intra-conservative Catholic drama debate over distributism. The two primary contenders were Christopher Ferreira and Tom Woods. Now, it started, as far as I can tell, from Christopher's point of view. They both wrote, co-authored a book together about the traditional mass. I think it was something like Sacred Then, Sacred Now, I think was what it was called. And he had thought that he and Tom were on the same page. And somehow he figured out Tom was a libertarian, and he just kind of freaks out. So why don't you set the stage for this? Well, the book that they uh, wrote, of course, was not directly connected to this particular issue. Um, so it's kind of interesting that uh, Ferrero would project his own uh, rather specific views onto uh, what he expected of Tom. Um, we have to remember, though, that Tom Woods was not always a libertarian, uh, that there was an earlier period where he was more enthusiastically paleoconservative. And that was when he was in with Tom Fleming, who would later become one of his enemies because of this uh, particular incident that we're going to be discussing. <clears throat> but basically, what the issue at hand is, that um, from the writing of G.K. Chesterton and um, who's the, the fellow with the French name? Uh, Hilaire Belloc? Hilaire Belloc, exactly. Um, they started, there was um, a, a turn in Roman Catholic circles which sought to find a middle ground between capitalism and socialism, and that's called distributism. <clears throat> um, now, one problem with this is that nobody really seems to know what distributism is. Um, I, I think that you might describe it in three different types of ways. You might say on the one hand, it's a kind of romantic nostalgia for the old guild system, uh, like price control, wage control, the kind of things you had in the medieval period, which are seen as pre-Weberian capitalist. Uh, on the other hand, I think that a lot of it comes out of the sort of Tory high church attempt to reach out to the labor movement in the Victorian period to sort of um, to bypass the classical liberal capitalists, the Manchester liberals. But as it relates to more liberal um, times or more, more modern times, I think that what uh, it, its influence seems to be is, is trying to um, find some kind of almost populist uh, sort of um, Irish Catholic sort of middle ground between the sort of Protestant um, Calvinist work ethic kind of right and the socialist anti-Christian left. But it's all very vague because it's more of an attitude. And I think, to be honest, it it's really depends on who is advocating distributism, whether or not it, it means socialism or doesn't mean socialism. But I think that distributism is really often kind of like socialism for Catholics. Um, and in, in this particular um, situation, what I remember happening is around 2005, maybe, <clears throat> Tom Woods, and this is where it all came out, wrote a book called Church and Market, which was saying that, A, the church teachings do not extend to matters of economics, because that's a scientific matter, doesn't pertain to faith and morals, that's the how, not the why. Secondly, um, one may be a free market advocate or a libertarian and still be Catholic. And I suppose, thirdly, not everything that the church presents authoritatively is necessarily, has not necessarily reached the status of an infallible doctrine. And what I remember, the first response I encountered to that was something Scott P. Richard wrote in uh, Chronicles, a magazine of American culture, which is a very severe paleoconservative publication, basically saying that Woods was a heretic, that he was not Catholic anymore, that how dare he, and, and the amount of earnestness with which they pursued this was just astounding. Like Tom Woods came out and said he wasn't even Christian 
uh, let alone Catholic, because he had written this book. And then <clears throat> my favorite part, we've talked about this before, is when they bring in Thomas Stork, who's like the guest star for that season of Chronicles. And as far as I can see, Stork was a kind of like John Paul II mainline, but very holier than thou Catholic, who really does not fit with the Chronicles MO, but they kind of brought out the big guns by having the Stork fellow brought in, who, who then, you know, sort of sort of uh, led the crusade against Tom Woods, and then of course all the libertarians at lourockwell.com, and even some priests, like a few priests in the fraternity of St. Peter, took up the other side, and that's really how the drama began to play out. Yes. Um, one other participant, uh, though not quite in the direct line of fire, was John C. Medale. He wrote Toward the Truly Free Market, a distributor's perspective on the role of government taxes and health care, deficits and more. Now, Medale was probably one of the more reasonable distributors, one who you could read and say, hmm, that was more than just a, uh, you know, agitprop. But one of the things that we see often today with SJWs, like, is so-and-so a racist? Or I think so-and-so is deeply homophobic. That is exactly the kind of tactics the distributists would use against Tom Woods. So, for example, they open up by saying, is Tom Woods a dissenter? I mean, like, you know, that's a total SJW tactic. And, and they just used it all the time. And whatever the actual truth value of the statements were, as far as like behavior, Tom Woods easily was uh, had the moral high ground. Because A, he didn't start the fight. Uh, B, he only really intervened in order to clear his name. I mean, he's being accused of heresy by all of these right-wing, you know, uber traditional Catholics. You know, he's he can't let that... Stan, he's got to clear his, you know, name. Say, I'm not really a heretic here, guys. Um, and the other thing is, you you've got um, that uh, the Acton Institute with Father Sirico. Now, he's not technically an ANCAP like Tom Woods, but he is, uh, you know, a neoliberal capitalist economist and a Roman Catholic. And you know, you've got also plenty of uh, neocon Catholics working for, you know, the Conservative Chronicle and other groups, all of which are broadly free market in their orientation. And there was really never any question of their Catholic orthodoxy. Uh, so I think it's hard to figure why you'd pick on Tom Woods and not these other guys. I think Tom Woods was perceived as an easy target, right? Intercapitalists are kind of seen as weird. They, at the time, they didn't really have a large influential Catholic following uh, whereas the Acton Institute and sort of more traditionally neoconservative Catholics have very powerful institutions behind them, and they would they would not make for an easy target. So I think in part Tom Woods just had a bullseye on his tape to his back, basically. Well, it's funny how Tom Woods often seems to bring that out of people from the first time that he published his first book. It's like people love to go after Tom Woods, even though he's the most reasonable, one of the most reasonable people on the entire new right. As to these things you've been saying about um, the accusations of heresy, well, I don't really understand if that's your point of view, if that's the point of view of these distributists, what's the point, and many of the almost well, maybe not all of them, but a lot of those Chronicles people are converts from Episcopalianism. So uh, presumably at some point they had some motivation for becoming Roman Catholics as opposed to Episcopalians. In Roman Catholic theology, there's a mechanism for uh, making a doctrine a doctrine, uh, namely through papal infallibility, through ecumenical councils and some other mechanisms. So why it kind of defeats the purpose of having that whole mechanism in place, which is often that that mechanism is often the reason that these people claim they became Catholics in the first place. But if you start taking up other opinions that have never been doctrinally defined, why? what's the point of even maintaining your position in the first place? Um, <clears throat> not to mention the irony that if you have such a scrupulous uh, perspective on what constitutes doctrine and what doesn't, you have to take into account that many of these people reject Vatican II. Many of the distributists are in rejection of a lot of, you might say, extra doctrinal 
positions that the, that the uh, church has put forward. But here's the greatest uh, example of irony is that Thomas Fleming, who was one of the most vituperative people in this whole um, in this whole affair, is an advocate of the deadly duel of the Old West, which was so strongly condemned by the church that you would be excommunicated just for witnessing one of them. The church never excommunicated anyone for being an advocate of the free market. So it's so clear that they only are so scrupulous about what constitutes Catholic doctrine when it serves a paleoconservative worldview. Yeah, well, one of the one of the things that I remember when I, when I actually read some of the older Catholic arguments, uh, you know, encyclicals about economics that were being thrown around by these types, you know, you, you can get most of them on. Uh, I think Rerum. What was the one from the 1870s? Was that Rerum Navarum? I can't remember the or the Quadradissimo Anno. One of those was yeah, like th those are the two. The latter one you mentioned is much more severe. Um, but the one that they always talk about is Rerum Novarum. Now that was under Leo the Thirteenth, so it would have had to been later than that date. Okay. The reason being was, uh, for example, on the Catholic Encyclopedia, uh, the 1913 edition, which is for free online, whenever you look up things like capitalism, socialism, communism, while it's not overly friendly to capitalism, it's not, you know, libertarian by any stretch. It, it saves its uh, the, the the Catholic Encyclopedia saves its biggest salvos for communists and socialists. Um, they, it seems the impression that I got was they wanted some sort of regulated capitalism with unions, um, which granted may not be libertarian, but it's certainly not anti-capitalist, and if anything, it's anti-socialist. Uh, which that that milieu of Catholic teaching on that issue, at least that's what it felt like to me. Right. Well, let's focus on Rerum Novarum because that's the most, that's the one that they always cited. Now, I have read Rerum Novarum several times, and what I've been struck by is that it is startlingly moderate. It is not um, a, a, a socialist or even a distributist text. It in, in no uncertain terms condemns all forms of socialism and capitalism, or, or pardon me, socialism and communism. When it comes to capitalism, it's highly qualified in terms of what it says. It says, well, if a just situation can't be reached under capitalism, then a regulation would be necessary. But that's an if. And it says, and and it says it it, it condemns all um, you know forms of of labor violence. It doesn't really sp specify any restriction that has to be placed on the free market. It just says the free market can only be um, can only be recognized as a valid position if it's able to fulfill these other um, criteria. It doesn't say whether it actually is able to uh, fulfill those criteria or not. Um, and there is something uh, else that uh, I had on my mind, but it's it uh, seemed to have slipped away from me. So back over to you. One thing that was the charge leveled against Tom Woods was that he was a crypto Protestant because in his book, The Church and the Market, he argued that the Pope's infallible teaching authority did not extend economics. Now, I don't have a list in front of me, but as far as I know, there is no Catholic dogma that directly speaks to economics. And uh, when it comes to Catholic dogmas, as a Catholic, you are required to believe those. But beyond the Catholic dogmas, there is a certain range of leeway, which is why you have, you know, the, the Thomists and the Scotists and the Alchemists. They, they, you know, they have their in-house disagreements. But unless the distributors could demonstrate that any part of their doctrine was within the Catholic dogma, then there's really no way you can make the charge stick that Tom Woods was a heretic or, or, or a crypto Protestant. And, and furthermore, it doesn't necessarily follow because when the Pope is infallible ex cathedra, it's from the chair on matters of faith and morals. Now, that does. I mean, obviously, even a distributist wouldn't say that the Pope could speak infallibly on the matter of engineering a house, or 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 fixing a leaky boat. I mean, obviously, that's not his area of competence, and nobody would have a disagreement with that. And 
that's exactly the argument Tom Woods was making, but applying it to economics. It's not within the Pope's competency to make such a statement uh, in any sort of binding manner. And now what they'll say is, oh, well, well economics is just moral philosophy. So, you know, checkmate Tom Woods. But it's like there's a certain level of, of nuance that the distributist faction wasn't really willing to engage with. And while you could argue there's an element of moral philosophy to capitalist thought, to say that it's reducible to moral philosophy, I think, is a category mistake. Well, there are a number of different angles from uh, which to approach this particular issue. One thing that's crossed my mind is you have this uh, process of declaring things infallible from the chair. So if these people are um, such strict traditional Catholics, why it's suspicious that they never took the time to say, well, this issue is important to us, therefore we would like these things to be declared in an ecumenical council or uh, infallibly ex cathedra in a papal encyclical, um, because that's why that mechanism's there. It's so that when there are disputes, that uh, the the Pope or the bishops can come in and settle it definitively. But it seems like they wanted to just read a pre-existing status of infallibility with respect to their rejection of capitalism and bypass that procedure altogether. Now, there is a technical point um, on, on which they may have, have some ground to stand on, which is that there's something in Catholic doctrine called the uh, universal ordinary magisterium, which means if all the bishops teach the same thing at one time, then that does reach uh, infallible status. So something like teaching against abortion, right? That's never been declared against, but it's been understood to be consistently applied over a certain period of time. And so it's kind of doctrine by default. Uh, so the Pope can't just wake up one day and declare that the resurrection of Christ was only figurative or spiritual or something, even though that's never been uh, defined. Um, so basically what they are were assuming is that the church's condemnation of capitalism was so certain that um, it had reached infallible status within the ordinary uh, universal magisterium. Now, A, I think that anybody who's going to make that contention, the burden of proof is on them to demonstrate that before they start calling people heretics. And secondly, Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, well, I'll just finish this thought uh, quickly. Um, and, and I think that that furthermore, these people who, like I said, Thomas Fleming uh, supported the duel of the Old West and was nostalgically looking back to it. And that was so, the, the duel has been condemned by the church throughout history going back to medieval Europe. Right, it, it has just as much longevity as anything that the church says has to say about economics. So why is Tom Piatic and Thomas Stork and all these other people, Christopher Ferrara, why are they okay hanging around Tom Fleming, but not Tom Woods? And secondly, by that definition, by that view of things, you would have to support not only um, the divine right of kings, but also you would have to support um, basically usury laws. How many paleocons are actually going to come out in support of the kind of usury laws that were so uh, widely recognized in the medieval period? It's just a total case of special pleading. Exactly. The point that I was going to make is that to claim that the Catholic Church's view of capitalism is as decisively negative as it would be, say, against abortion uh, is is just patently absurd because no matter how you define capitalism, almost everybody admits that modern markets developed in northern Italy with Venice, Genoa, and Florence. There's no evidence at all that the papacy in the 16th or 17th century opposed the mercantile revolution that Venice and Genoa were behind. In fact, uh, in the Low Countries, while well, Holland eventually became Protestant, Belgium remained Catholic and along with England was one of the earliest nations to engage in the Industrial Revolution. And of course, what precipitated that sort of channel economic development was that was the westernmost fringe of the Hanseatic League, which was a sophisticated merchant system in uh, me you know, medieval Europe. 
And so in, in Northern Italy and in the low countries where modern capitalism develops by pretty much everybody's assertion, the Catholic Church was quite friendly with Venice. More often than not, they were on the same side against the French or the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and so from their from their actions in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, there's not any of it, I don't see any evidence at all um, this was the case. And this is sort of the artistic monarchism of the reactionary Catholics. It's almost like Venice, Genoa didn't even exist, even though they were some of the most successful and long-lasting Catholic states in history. Well, in this regard, the distributists do have a point when they're talking to people like Tom Woods, that he does read too much in the past, into the past. The paleo-libertarians do have a habit of making it look as if um, you know, like like uh, Keir Martland gets up and gives speeches that almost make the medieval period sound like it was anarcho-capitalism, right? And, and so there is, you know, there is a kind of silliness to that. But what I would say is that, of course, there was a pre-capitalist element to the church's conduct in the past for the same reason that there is a socialistic elements in early Protestants. Um, it's it's because we're dealing with different historical circumstances. I mean, yes, there, there was a kind of socialism in the medieval period. But then again, Martin Luther also advocated to the policies which they would consider uh, highly socialistic or at least collectivistic. Um, so there are elements of capitalism that arise out of Catholicism, like with the 16th century Jesuits. Uh, but there are also elements um, of capitalism that are, are, arrive sort of sooner in Protestant countries or, or you know, more uh, dramatically in places like Great Britain. Secondly, I kind of want to call the distributists out on this because they are acting like their position is in favor of this kind of down on their luck Irish Catholic immigrant uh, sort of uh, disenfranchised Catholic in a cutthroat Protestant capitalist world, when really there's a serious snob factor that's being overlooked here. And then I think the origins of their attitude may be suspiciously Anglican. Because as I said, in the uh, period of the Oxford movement with people like Benjamin Disraeli and the, the high Tory phenomenon, uh, there was an attempt to reach out to the socialists because it was thought that they would be allies with the Anglican aristocracy over the Manchester liberals. And I think a lot of the attitude has come from this kind of Chestertonian, John Henry Newman, Benjamin Disraeli, this kind of romantic uh, elitist Anglican Tory perspective, which was then imported into the Catholic church. And so uh, in, a, in a roundabout way, I think that, that there is a sort of uh, cultural elitism about which um, the distributists are not entirely forthright. Mm, yeah, it, it, that, that's sort of where the sort of, uh, what's the word, uh, disingenuousness of the claim that, well, distributism is the sort of working man's economic system, we're the advocates of the working man's issues, when they're all essentially the equivalent of blue bloods with the same taste, uh, snobbery, and social class. And it, it well, which really gets to the fact that distributism is, is more of a mood um, because when you look at the famous debate between um, G.K. Chesterton and George Bernard Shaw, uh, moderated by Hilaire Bella called Do We Agree? Like he, he literally advocates for straight up socialist policies, government control of certain industries, for example, coal. And Shaw makes this very prescient point. He says, look, if you agree with me that some industries should be government controlled for the public good, then one, how are you not a socialist? And two, why don't we do that for all government and for all industries? And if you look at the argument, he just basically engages in special pleading. It's like he says, well, it's a case by case basis. It may not be good in this case, but it's good in another case. No, on the face of it, that's not necessarily a bad argument. But where I felt like Chesterton was being dishonest was he was fundamentally agreeing with the underlying principles of Shaw. And so if you agree with those fundamental underlying principles, then you really can't have a case-by-case -case basis application. You either apply it everywhere or you don't. Um, 
And so we know he was just frankly wrong because state management of coal was a disaster, which led to the winter of discontent in 1979. So, you know, when you could actually test distributed theories in practice, it wasn't really all that effective. Um, and it's also interesting, too, that the idea of, uh, what was it, three acres and a cow, wasn't that the distributed slogan? I mean, if anything, the closest approximation to distributism was, was Abraham Lincoln's land grant. When he opened up the West to homesteaders, the Homestead Act, that's the closest thing we've ever really had to distributism. And they don't really mention that. It's, it's very odd. Um, and the other thing they don't mention is one piece of evidence they could adduce to support their claim that, you know, it's not too many, it's, it's not, uh, the problem isn't capitalism per se, we, there's just too few, there's too few private property owners. Uh, you could, you could, you know, adduce the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, where the land was allocated by lot based on the needs of the households, the doc, the, the teachings of the Jubilee and the Sabbath, but whether it's biblical inspiration or whether it's a practical application, like again, the Homestead Act, they're completely silent, which is really strange. And if they were a rigorous intellectual uh, group, you would expect to see things like that. Right, and I mean, an example of this is Tom Fleming, who actually, I, I read him saying that we have to distinguish between church teaching and just politics of the day that are portrayed as church teaching. And the reason that he wanted to point this out was because he's a kind of old South neo-Confederate type. So he was trying to say, well, you can be a Republican, a small R classical Republican. You don't have to be a medieval monarchist. But yet he's not willing to apply that standard to uh, the capitalism distributism debate. I remember the thing that I was going to say before, and I think it's rather funny that Tom Woods had an episode not long ago of his show where he, he recounted that he uh, had a nice talk with um, a bishop, um, I'm forgetting his name uh, now, the former superior of the uh, Society of St. Pius X, Bishop Filet. And he said that they got along rather well. He you know, talked to him for an hour or whatever. And he said that Bishop Richard Williamson, the most extreme Catholic traditionalist, too conservative to be in the Society of St. Pius X, the ultra trad con, when he was traveling through the States, he said, I want to speak to Woods. He called up his diocese and said, I want to speak with Woods. And he had his respect for Tom Woods and he wanted to speak with him to get his opinion on things. So if Bishop Williamson is able to get along with Tom Woods and Bishop Filet, these, these uh, more Catholic than the Pope, uh, Society of St. Pius X bishops are able to get along with him just fine, if you are unable to get along with him, um, then that's indicative of a very large attitude problem. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, the 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 other aspect too is this this is a part of the broader historical narrative of the distributists uh, of this particular faction we're discussing. The idea that. Uh, well, they're not ANCAPs like Keir Martland. They do have this sort of strange ahistorical view of the Middle Ages. Uh, they'll say, oh, the Middle Ages was distributist. But no, it wasn't. If you were a serf on the demands, you didn't own it. You had, to, you had to give a certain portion of your produce to the Lord, uh, and the Lord could dictate where you lived, you know, how you traveled. Uh, I've heard, you know, some sometimes people exaggerate. I've heard, you know, who you can marry, but certainly where you could travel was restricted heavily in the Middle Ages. You didn't own the land you worked. That's precisely why socialism had such an appeal to peasant European societies, precisely because they did not own the land they worked. Um, and no, no, the medieval economic system was not distributism. It was feudalism in most of Europe. And in certain areas like, say, uh, Iceland, northern Italy, in the low countries, it was proto-capitalist. Um, distributism, where you have, again, the only country that even remotely approximated distributism was the United States, where most settlers could, uh, the saying was it was land rich but population poor. So most settlers could get a homestead. Um, and of course, you know, for these people, like, just like Iran, the United States is the great Satan. So, you know, go figure. <laughs>
Right. I think that there is a kind of left-wing analog or precursor to distributism in the uh, economic theory known as Georgianism, which was uh, favored by Thomas Paine, uh, the American uh, revolutionary figure. I'm not entirely certain about what the, the distinctions between um, distributism and Georgism, Georgianism are. But what I will say is this, is they're often very explicit about the desire to return to an agrarian society, right? Now, to my thinking, this is a much more uh, severe mistake than, say, supporting a kind of um, mitigated uh, capitalism, maybe like social uh, democracy or, or in liberal democracy, where you have a kind of um, a welfare state in a capitalist society, because at least there the vision is still industrial. I can't really imagine any kind of return to uh, pre-industrialism. It's like they think that they're all just going to wake up in the Chronicles of Narnia or something. What it would mean is mass starvation and you know a massive population reduction and just general misery in the whole of society. Yeah, it's again, it's something they haven't really thought through. The other aspect too was uh, the distributist review. Um, they their uh, practical measures that they advocated to be taken to redistribute the property in the way that they would desire was essentially the same sort of techniques the socialists would use. They, re they recommended a um, progressive income tax, like we need more of that. <laughs> um, and I don't think this guy was a distributist, but there was a, uh, not to dox myself, but there was a Catholic uh, school near where I went to school. And I asked one of the uh, teachers there who taught economics, who was a social justice, you know, anti-capitalist Catholic, he was probably more of a socialist than a distributist. But, you know, for, for, for him, you know, it, it's just this complete, uh, you know, abolition of, of capitalism. And they they don't really think about uh, what what to replace it with, what exactly is the alternative. Now, he, he seemed to favor uh, the Jesuits in Paraguay. But... Um, Basically, what when I told him, I said, "Look, if the state redistributes property, it's just going to keep it like the Soviets." And literally, he gave me the ultimate cop out. Well, it's part of what in the kingdom of God, so it's 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 going to work out anyhow because the Bible says so. And like, wait, so the state redistributing property is a part of building the kingdom of God? Like, that's a news flash. <laughs> Well, I mean, you could always uh, advocate uh, Thomas Stork's position that we need to uh, restore the German historical school of economics. That seemed to be his answer. But um, I, I will say that another irony uh, of, of these people uh, is that many of, um, including Chesterton, by the way, Chesterton was a sympathizer with the Old South. Uh, in, in the American Civil War, Thomas Fleming uh, is most of almost all of Chronicles magazine is. They, these people are all um, advocates or, or uh, sympathizers with the South in the American Civil War. I can't think of really any standard by which the uh, South in the American uh, the, the the American South antebellum. Uh, fit with the standard of distributism. In fact, I think that with with aside from slavery, the South might have been the closest that any society has ever come to a kind of civilized uh, free market society. Um, that is, it was it was remarkably close to the kind of uh, economic arrangement that the paleo libertarians advocate. And of course, they really draw a, 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 a connection between the South and uh, Catholicism, right? They'll point out how Jefferson Davis got along with Pius the Ninth how he was raised by the Dominicans, and uh, all, all of this is true. Um, but it's kind of um, strange that they, they had none of these things, that you basically had uh, what Thomas Jefferson calls a free economy in the South, um, with the one exception being slavery, which was roundly condemned by the church. Um, so in other words, the one aspect in which the South was not a free market economy was um, the area where the, the was was in the form of a coercive institution, which the church was trying to end. Um, so that's another 
thing that makes their perspective odd. Well, yeah. And um, I suppose there's another member uh, to bring to the show. He's maybe not uh, directly uh, uh, engaged with Tom Woods, but he represents the same sort of Chronicles line as E. Michael Jones. Uh, and in his book, The Bear in Metal, uh, he, he gives this sort of standard distributist argument. The Middle Ages was distributist. Uh, it was anti-capitalist. Uh, again, I, I guess the Italian city-states in the Lombard League and the uh, Lubeck and uh, the Hanseatic League didn't exist, but whatever. We can pretend that didn't happen. Um, and, you know, we need to, uh, you know, bring back the Holy Roman Empire and, and, and all, all of these, these, these things. And it, it really is bizarre how, why, how and why these people pick their fights. So, for example, he's very critical of the United States for its part in the rise of, of, of uh, more well, more specifically, U.S. Protestants for their role in capitalism. But bizarrely, he his the hero of his the, the, the nation that represents the ideals he values is Germany, which is a Lutheran nation, and he glosses over Bismarck's culture conf against the Catholic Church. I mean, if you look at the United States at its worst treatment of Catholics, and you compare that to Bismarck's culture conf, there's literally no comparison. But you're going to go out of your way to attack U.S. Protestants, but then sort of ignore Bismarck's culture conf? I mean, it's hard to understand what rubric these people are using. Well, another thing just came to mind uh, to me is that the the American North, which is basically the type of culture that most of the distributists are condemning, that is big business, big bank, uh, industrial, uh, it's almost like they imagine that that society rose out of the free market. Uh, when the kind of agrarian society that they're romanticizing was literally uh, the result of uh, basically free trade and just uh, kind of allowing the economy to uh, run itself. I'm not really coming down in favor of one side or the other, but it seems almost like they've got it backwards in that, I mean, if you look at the North, right, it had, uh, it had various kinds of property distribution, it had high tariffs, it had, it had um, a central, uh, it, it favored, um, uh, the banking system, you know, in a way that I suppose uh, you, you might say it tended towards favoring uh, centralized control of the money supply. In other words, all of these things that fit with a kind of paleoconservative uh, economic vision were literally the policies that led to the rise of the industrialized North. Uh, whereas by contrast, um, the kind of society that they even seem to be advocating was um, working in tandem with the most free market part of the country. Now, I think eventually the South would have industrialized, but that's kind of beside the point. As I don't know how they even configure how these things played out. Yeah, it's very bizarre, the sort of uh, gymnastics they they go through uh, to, to make their point. I mean, the... If, if you look at the stated goal of, of distributism is to have property ownership as widely distributed as possible uh, within a given you know state or region. Now, you know, we can debate over what they mean by productive property. Do they mean land? Do they mean the means of production? It's not ever entirely clear, though, of course, land is maybe the most intuitive. But... What, what, I, what I think is really kind of the joke here, right, is this kind of attitude of, of widely distributed land, uh, of homesteaders, is a deeply Anglo-Protestant attitude. And, 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 and in many ways, it's difficult to envision distributism arising outside of an Anglo-Protestant context anyhow. And so while they, while they claim to be battling the, you know, the many-headed hydras of Luther, they are essentially adopting an economic sentiment that only really arose within Anglo-Protestant culture. Right. It's basically the economics of the gentry of Southern England being uh, confused for Catholic dogma. Yes. 
And and these are the self same people that the distributists complain appropriated church property under Henry VIII. <laughs> That's the joke, right? That's the joke. The very people who they always complain about for appropriating church property are exactly the ones who they look to for advice in constructing an economy. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, there's not much to uh, add on that specific line of thinking. I mean, um, I, I, I think that, yeah, it, it has, um, it really has the Oxford movement written all over it. I mean, from a from an objective historical point of view, if we look at the kinds of economic modes of production that Catholic nations had historically, would be uh, the Roman latifundia system in the Western Empire prior to the collapse between Constantine and the collapse, uh, feudalism, which was you know most of Europe, with the exception of again the, the uh, Italian city states and the Hanseatic League, which you could argue were proto-capitalist. And, and uh, then a slave economy uh, with the Spanish Empire in Brazil. And those were really the three main modes of production. And neither one the Catholic Church dogmatically really spoke on. And it's not, you know, so with such a given diversity, is there one true Catholic mode of production? I mean, well, I guess there was another mode of production I forgot, which would be socialism in Paraguay, where the Jesuits had a completely collectivized economy for 150 years which incidentally, uh, the, the wage earnings of the Indians in Paraguay compared somewhat favorably to the income earnings of Western Europeans at the same time. So we have four modes of production here, none of which had the explicit blessing, uh, the, the sole blessing of the Catholic Church. So the historical record is clear in the sense that there is no explicitly Catholic mode of production. Well, this is something that I think that the distributists and others are not really willing to come to terms with, and it is that the church's politics just end up being whatever politics are popular in the era in question. Um, so you look at the church today, right? Basically, Pope Francis's position is that the, the church's uh, political uh, teaching is cultural Marxism. That's basically the, the stance. In the 20th century, it was that the church's position is liberal democracy because that's what was in at that point. Um, you, you look at, at the um, early 20th century and late 19th century, well, the church's politics were basically in synchronization with various political movements that were already operating in Europe at that time. Um, in the medieval period, of course, it was the politics of the medieval period that were the church's teaching. Um, and none of these people, uh, not the people in question, uh, like uh, the Chronicles magazine crowd, they don't accept uh, Francis's teaching on, um, on immigration, for example, or in favor of hate speech laws or affirmative action. They would just dismiss that idea that that is Catholic doctrine uh, just out of hand. And likewise, uh, many of these people are kind of uh, neo-Confederate, small-R Republicans. Well, they don't support uh, anti-usury laws. They don't support monarchies, monarchy. But for some reason, the politics uh, as they existed in, say, 1870 are infallible. Yeah, I exactly. And, when, and, and, and as you pointed out in the beginning of this conversation, what, what really, I think, is is interesting about the distributists in this dis discussion within Catholic circles is, is really how immature they were. They really, they, they, the only argument they had against Tom Woods and other pro-capitalist Catholics, not even libertarians necessarily, someone like, a, you know, the Lord Acton Institute with uh, Father Sirico, he's not an NCAP. Um, or, or Catholic writers like, like for example, the late Phyllis Schlafly. Um, I think she was still alive when those distributist debates were going on. I mean, you could broadly call her neoconservative, uh, and was broadly free market. And yet, you know, they didn't go after those people. And to the extent that they came up, oh, they're just, they're just heretics. I mean, that, that's a very juvenile way to go about it, especially in a topic with such nuance and isn't even directly touched on by Catholic dogma.
Well, I mean, speaking of this uh, juvenile attitude, I um, once went looking for uh, Thomas Stork's uh, publications on other issues for masochistic purposes. And uh, I uh, found a, 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 an article that he had written on uh, the topic of religious liberty. Now, I think anybody who's objective about the history of Catholic Church will know that encyclicals in the late 19th and early 20th century by the, the Catholic popes were um, hostile to religious liberty. They were in condemnation of it. Uh, the encyclical Pascendi. Uh, I have a whole anthology of uh, encyclicals that were basically in condemnation of religious freedom. Um, and uh, the syllabus of errors, the same way, no mistaking what they taught. Vatican II clearly taught the opposite. It taught that uh, religious liberty is a um, you know, universal human right to be enforced by the UN or whatever it actually says in Vatican II. Um, and Thomas Stork, because he, you know, he wanted to defend this idea that that the position that the 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 uh, churches uh, teaching even in areas where you might not think it's infallible actually is because it's been perfectly consistent. He shamelessly wrote an article that, and then this or essay or whatever it was, saying, "Well, actually, the church's teaching on religious liberty never did change because uh, when." when Pius IX wrote the syllabus of errors, he was only referring to congregations. Vatican II was referring to the individual's right to religious liberty. So there actually was no change in the teaching. So this is how they get, uh, they, they get around it. They basically produce a corrective narrative where they actually change what was said in order to portray a consistency that was never there so that they can then say that they're rather historically uh, involved position was in fact consistently the church's teaching uh, throughout history. And um, so when you're engaging at that level of um, intellectual flexibility, it, it's very difficult to, um, it, it makes someone very difficult to argue with because it's like they haven't accepted the standards by which argumentation takes place. Exactly. Uh, another sort of strange uh, contradiction is someone like Chesterton and, and even to a lesser extent Belloc were quite favorable of English democracy. During uh, the interwar period, Chesterton wrote a lot about uh, how English democracy is basically Catholic, which you know is, is laughable given that the track record of the Catholic Church's opposition to democratic movements throughout Europe. But Again, he's adopting this essentially Anglo-Protestant value and then claiming the Catholics always believed it. And being the godfather of distributism, the modern-day distributists are anti-democratic. They generally are extremely critical of dem uh, democracy. They're either monarchists or, as you said, lower all republicans, like, like the um, Confederacy. Oddly enough, not the Italian city-states. But it's, uh, again, this, this, this gross contradiction between the overall agenda of being, you know, uh, uber Catholic, um, you know, uh, infallible Pope bros, you know, they just always do what the Pope really means. They know what the Pope means better than he does. But then, you know, they always also, <laughs> they, they, they have these really bizarre contradictions because democratic principles are not like trad. So Chesterton's a bit off on that one. And a lot of Chesterton's uh, spiritual successors are anti-democratic. So it leads to these strange relationships. Well, uh, speaking of Chesterton, one of the um, strange uh, things about all of this is that in the, the earlier days, the distributists were actually willing to uh, speak to the free market types. Like there were publications that had... Uh, people who are at least nominally free market, like William F. Buckley, talking to distributists, uh, sort of in the whole fusionist epoch. Um, so the idea that that this was misunderstood to be uh, the exclusive Catholic approach is um, rather uh, different from the behavior, the more uh, contemporary behavior of the distributists, because uh, you know while they may have been snooty at times. I'm not sure that uh, Chesterton would have approved of their behavior. Well, exactly. Um, 
And and certainly, even though Chesterton had his moments as well, he did demonstrate in his debate with George Bernard Shaw, he could be reasonably civil with a, for lack of a better word, mortal enemy, a, a socialist atheist. Uh, I mean, if Chesterton could have that level of civility with a socialist atheist, and the distributists cannot maintain that level of civility with a uh, basically, you know, card-carrying Catholic like Tom Woods. What does that tell you about the uh, decline in distributed standards? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, a, a, a part of it is I think it's a convergence between a number of things. A, and I think that the three things, one I mentioned, it's basically English, Anglican, Toryism, which is kind of an import into Catholicism. The second thing is that there is an attitude problem with Catholicism, not that other groups don't have attitude problems, but there is a uniquely Catholic attitude problem, which basically consists of pretending that things are doctrines when it has not been established that they are doctrines and pretending that inconsistencies don't exist where they clearly exist. Now, say 70 years ago, this attitude was mostly expressed through neo-Thomism. Uh, basically through this idea that, yeah, basically in order to be Catholic, you basically have to be a, a, a devotee of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, then at Vatican II, that all changed. They switched things around. Now suddenly ecumenism is good. Religious liberty is good. Uh, we need to open up things to kind of neo-Augustinian uh, philosophers, and we're just going to rethink everything. And then that became the new MO of the Catholic Church. And and bizarrely, this new, the, the nouveau theological era, which is kind of coming to a close with Francis, because I think he's almost something else. Um, but that kind of original Vatican II ethos was just as brazen and basically identifying itself with what it meant to be Catholic as the original uh, neo-scholastic hegemony did. And so that's a kind of second strand that I think is influencing these people. And thirdly, I think it's just a paleoconservative thing. I think it's just your kind of narrow-minded grandfather sitting in the corner who just you know, knows best because he's had more life experience. And in that sense, it might be uh, extra denominational because it seems like even the non-Catholic paleocons seem to have that attitude. Yeah. Um, is there anything like anything else you'd like to add to this conversation to wrap up the uh, the distributist debate? Uh, not much. I'd say that unfortunately, uh, Chronicles has a habit of uh, updating its um, its archive. So uh, a lot of these old blog posts and articles are no longer available or they're hidden deep within the bowels of the uh, website or you uh, have to subscribe. Certainly, um, like even if you can find all the major articles, uh, unfortunately, a lot of this was communicated through blog posts, which I don't think are available uh, any longer. But Chronicles uh, is still out there. LouRockwell.com is still out there. But, um, you know, if we can be thankful for something uh if we can be thankful for anything in the in the age of uh, new social justice anxieties it's that well at least these issues are the least of our problems now that could be yeah it could be true thanks again right ruminations for coming on it's always a pleasure well thank you todd uh, i'm sure my uh, channel will be linked to below mm -hmm. this is todd lewis of the praise of folly podcast signing off